Introducing Dr. Dobbs Life 2.0, a community for Second Life developers. Learn more about the Linden scripting language, web integration, and open source sims on Dr. Dobbs Island in Second Life. For more information, visit life20.net. In this video, I'm going to take a departure from some of the normal programming topics and talk about a programming environment that I've been working in lately that's probably the most fun programming environment I've ever come across. So here you see me flying around in a virtual world that's known as Second Life. Um, and it actually moves a lot smoother than this. I just I obviously am recording my desktop, which is which is introducing a certain amount of lag. But Second Life is a, um, like I said, virtual universe. You have an avatar in here. And the fascinating thing about Second Life is that every single thing you see in here is user created. So that courtyard and buildings that I was flying around a minute ago are user created. And if you want to create your own stuff in Second Life and you don't own your own land, then you can go to a public sandbox. So here I'm in a sandbox and we can see spaceships and mech warriors and houses and all kinds of different things that people are working on. These objects are made out of primitive shapes like squares and spheres and uh, cubes and, and those sorts of things. Um, they can be textured with any texture you want. Uh, and you can even put code inside of these objects. And that's one of the things that's really pretty interesting. So here inside of the sandbox, I'll just go ahead and create a prim or a primitive. This object is just a cube. And without any programming knowledge at all, there's a bunch of stuff that I can do with this. I can change its shape. So here I'll go ahead and um, shrink it down vertically so it's not so tall. Um, I can change things like what kind of base shape it's made out of. So this was a box type or essentially a cube. I could change it to a torus, for example. There's other properties of this object I can set. So normally it's got this sort of plywood texture. Um, I can go ahead and get rid of the texture or pick a different texture. It supports alpha blending. So I'm going to go ahead and make my object semi-transparent. And then um, another interesting thing that you can do in this world is, is the amount of stuff that you just get for free. So one of the things that you get for free is physics. Um, I can make this a physical object. So now all of a sudden it has a center of gravity and a mass and it just plummets to the ground as soon as I, I let go of it. Using my avatar, I can kind of move it around almost, you know, sort of telepathically, I guess. And again, as soon as I let go of it, it just, it just drops to the ground. I could make it, you know, land on my head if I wanted to. Um, and so you get all this stuff for free. You get the world that has ground and sky. You get your avatar. You get the ability to create these primitive objects. You get the ability to link them together in more complicated shapes. But for us programmers, you get the ability to write code. So here I'm writing code that lives inside of that object. And the code inside of that object is sitting there and it's running whether I'm in this world or not. So here I've got my sort of hello world code. If I just add script to the object, it puts in some default script so that when the object, when this code starts running, it says hello avatar. And whenever somebody touches the object, whenever they essentially click on it um, through their client, it will fire this touch start event. And in the touch start event, the object essentially says something out loud. Any avatar that was near it would hear that message. It would come in as a little you know, piece of text on the bottom of their screen. You can also have your objects listen. So here I'm setting up uh, a call to the listen method. I'm just telling it to listen to channel zero, which is just sort of the out loud channel that you talk on. And whenever this object hears something, again, this has nothing to do with whether I'm logged into Second Life or not, whenever this object just sitting there in the world hears something, um, it will trigger its listen event. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an object that just argues with me. I'm going to make it, um, you know, an argumentative and annoying little object. So it's going to say, whatever I say, it's just going to flat out disagree with. So the code's running, the object exists, I touch it, that starts its listener up, and now my avatar will just say something out loud and we'll see that my object responds. So I'll just say, today is a good day, and my object says, I don't agree with that. So incredibly useful. I mean, obviously looking around me here, you can see tanks and all kinds of stuff. So you can make some relatively complex things, but what I want to do is just kind of show some of the basics of 
creating objects and uh, scripting those objects, putting code in those objects it runs. The object can also sort of see the world. There's this um, sensor method call you can make that will let the object detect other things within a certain range. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have this object look for me. It's going to look for my avatar. It could look for other objects. Um, it could look for other avatars. But in this case, I'm just going to have my object look for me. Uh, and it's going to look for me anytime I'm within 20 meters of it in any direction. And whenever it finds me, it's going to fire an event. And every two tenths of a second, it's going to you know, essentially look around again and see if it can see me. So assuming that it does find me, it'll fire this sensor event. Now, if I was looking just for generic avatars or generic objects, it might see a whole bunch of stuff. When it looks around, it might see 20 objects or 20 avatars. In this case, because I told it the only thing to look for is me, the only thing, the, the number of items detected in the sensor event is, is only ever going to be one. And so the, the object it detects is going to be object zero. What I'm going to have this annoying object do, in addition to argue with me, is I'm going to have it chase me around the world. So it's going to see me, it's going to get my position, and then it's going to set its own position to wherever I'm at, only 1.2 meters above me. So essentially this object is going to chase me around and try to float right over my head. And as I move around, we'll see that you know it, it essentially tries to, to keep up with me. So now when I touch the object, it's immediately going to start following me. So again, not incredibly useful, but an example of you know, the kinds of things you can do. So I touch the object and there it goes. It just shot up off the ground and it's up over my head now. And when I walk around every, every uh, two tenths of a second, that object figures out where I am and moves above me. And I can move relatively fast. I can take off and fly around, but no matter where I go, that object's just going to keep chasing me and arguing with me. So I've created my own little, uh, my own little companion. Whoa, I just flew, an flew through an enormous cloud of Mario's. Um, and Bill Cosby's. What an interesting world we live in. Um, and again, just flying around here, you can see people working on all kinds of, you know, pretty ambitious projects, big mech warriors and um, buildings and, uh, you know, a little Stargate looking thing over there and a pretty, pretty detailed little spaceship. Everything in Second Life is created by the users. And it's honestly the most fun sandbox I've ever played in.